So since uh, Alka has disappeared, let me just sort of step in Alka on uh, this behalf. I, we can't hear you, Alka. The program session uh, starts with a brief introduction by Alka Palvecha. Uh, then we have a set of speakers who will be going with about nine minutes each, right? And so we have Gautami, we have Rakshita, Saurav, Neha, Marcel, and Vishwanath. And each presentation will be for nine minutes each. The speakers will introduce themselves before they begin their presentation, brief introduction about themselves and the topic that they're going to speak on or the institutions that they represent, and they have nine minutes each. And at the end of all the presentations, we'll have a, uh, a question and answer session. And so if you are listening in, please uh, make sure that you put your question and answer with the speaker's name in the chat box. So the chat box will be monitored by the organizers as well as by us, and we'll try to take in and fit in as many questions as is possible. So once again, a reminder, do not forget to mention the person you're asking the question to. So with that, um, if you're listening in, can we begin with uh, Gautami, Gautami Babiska, would you mind uh, beginning your presentation, please? Hello. Yeah, am I audible? You are loud and clear, Gautami. Okay, okay. Just I'm sharing my. Yeah. Yeah. Please confirm if my uh, screen is visible. It's absolutely visible. Gautami, you can go ahead, please. Okay, okay. Thank you. So a very good morning to one and all present here. So hello, I'm Gautami Bhaveska. I'm uh, currently pursuing uh, my master's in uh, geoinformatics from Indian Institute of Remote Sensing. And uh, I have completed my bachelor's in ur urban and regional planning. And uh, today, uh, me and my uh, colleague, Dr. Mansi, would be presenting on the topic people's participation in watershed. So uh, I hope all of you are keeping healthy and are uh, safely tucked in inside your homes. So yeah, so uh, basically uh, we would be talking about participation in watershed and we have taken uh, Upper Godavari Basin as our case study. Uh, and the, uh, this study is basically an extension of my undergraduate thesis, which was supervised by Dr. Mansi and Professor Uttal Sharma. Uh, so uh, across the globe, there are 300 plus uh, river basins, which crosses international borders. And uh, it is uh, roughly estimated that double of them are uh, within the country, which are the state level scale, uh, the regional scale, which is within the uh, district. Uh, and these uh, boundaries, the regional scale or inter-district uh, boundaries are not accounted or uh, not even properly documented. And as soon as we say uh, the urban-rural partnership in terms of water share, so this, these scales are really important to be accounted or documented as all the conflicts would uh, ignite from local to global scale. And uh, basically, our aim of this study was to uh, analyze the design principle, which were developed by uh, the Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom. And uh, uh, in, in terms of the uh, what is happening and what are the dynamics uh, in terms of the inter-district transboundary and using the institutional analysis and development framework. And below are the objectives to uh, fulfill our uh, aim of the study. So uh, talking about the research uh, approach, so uh, uh, the institutional analysis and development framework is used as a methodological frame and uh, basically to understand the interaction in this uh, trans inter-district transboundary, we, uh, we have used uh, design principles uh, among the eight, we have used seven design principles, and the, these design principles have helped to understand whether the transboundary water is a sustained case, sustainable case, or not, and uh, how basically the institutions are working towards the uh, uh, within uh, within state uh, uh, conflicts. So uh, our uh, study area, which is the Upper Godavari Subbasin, located in the Maharashtra state of India. So uh, this, ba this basin, particularly this basin, is witnessing uh, interbasin disputes 
uh, on water allocation due to their deficiency of water in various reservoirs. So this uh, case is a well-known case where uh, it is a unique case where uh, within the state and between three districts, they are having disputes and uh, a public uh, interest litigation was uh, filed for demanding the uh, water release. So user group was also involved in this case. Uh, uh, and basically, uh, this area have a higher probability in future to have conflicts uh, as more than 80% of the uh, basin area is in semi-arid in nature. So there are higher probability in future that uh, there can be more conflicts in this basin. Uh, and uh, in terms of area, so uh, the area is 21,000 square kilometers approximately, and it's home to uh, 10, more than 10 uh, million people. And uh, the unique thing is in this basin, there are uh, 33 uh, talukas, three districts fighting for water, and also rural areas are also uh, crying for help for the water as they are also suffering uh, from this uh, distress. Uh, for uh, our approach was that we have we carried out uh, uh, perception surveys, focus group discussion, expert interviews uh, at four villages. From we we have selected four villages from uh, tail region uh, and head region of the basin. And beside uh, perception survey, we also did a detailed geospatial timeline mapping of the basin to understand the social spatial uh, mechanism of the water governance. And also an institutional physiographical analysis was done to understand the upstream downstream dynamics uh, in this of this basin. This is a sample of the land utilization uh, mapping which shows the uh, uh, changes from 1995 to 2015. So uh, in, uh, our, we have uh, organized our results and uh, findings into the design principles. And I would like to emphasize on the two uh, major principles, which is collective choice arrangement and conflict resolution mechanism. So uh, the, uh, between the two uh, upstream and downstream regions, uh, at rural area, there was, it was seen that there, there is a water user association uh, uh, was set up uh, and it was a self-initiative. It was done by the user groups and uh, people were engaged uh, for, uh, for their share, for getting their share of water. Uh, of water. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, conflict resolution mechanism, so uh, there, uh, there is a regulatory authority uh, at state level and also Godavari uh, Institute uh, regulatory authority for the uh, basin level. So uh, there is a mechanism uh, in place for uh, managing this transboundary. And in terms of, of a learning was that uh, first of all, at uh, uh, inter-district level, there is no documentation of, uh, of the uh, transboundary water. So somewhere this scale is uh, unheard and unseen, which is which needs a limelight as when when we talk about a urban rural partnership. So the water share, it, it becomes vital to understand this scale uh, as uh, as all the conflicts would ignite from local to global level. And secondly, uh, in terms of uh, theoretical learning, we saw that th this stance boundary specifically the urban, uh, the upper Godavari uh, basin. Uh, it is a uh, it is a sustainable case as uh, there are more than five design principle in place, but somewhere there is a regional imbalance of water resources uh, in terms of per capita uh, water availability, where upstream uh, have more access to water compared to downstream, and further urban have more access to water compared to rural areas. So still there is a regional imbalance, but compared to other basins and other transboundary water. Uh, the th these uh, the upper godavari have a is a sustainable case as five design principles are in place and in terms of uh, contextual learning so in general the area uh, which uh, the basin uh, is in which is in the maharashtra is in the maharashtra state which in general receive less rainfall so uh, the case is uh, 
the state is in the water distress situation and they have to manage in the limited sources. So uh, the good thing came out that people, uh, although they didn't have a uh, uh, access to water, but they uh, they tried uh, managing themselves uh, uh, and tried to get their uh, share of water. Like uh, they used, uh, uh, like example, they used the support of microcredits. Then illegal water lifting was also seen. Then they tried to change the cropping pattern. And in extreme case, they used to work as a uh, temporary laborers in other farms. So other the issue I saw in uh, in this case was there is a huge transit losses when we talk about the uh, water share from upstream to downstream. So there is a huge transit losses uh, seen in, in, in this case. And there is a need to adopt micro irrigation techniques and use of remote sensing and new technology to manage this local level and regional level uh, scale. And there is a lot to learn from this uh, scale. So these local solutions could be adopted at, re, uh, at the global scale. So a lot to learn from this uh, uh, local scale. Then in, uh, in terms of institutional learning, so somewhere I found that hydrology, uh, hydrological boundaries are not paid attention uh, and uh, admin boundaries are given more emphasis in terms of planning. So there, there should be a shift to uh, planning into uh, hydrological boundaries should be taken into consideration. And secondly, regulatory authorities should uh, have more powers and should be uh, should be doing efficient water distribution and tariff uh, collection system. And there should be a real time monitoring uh, of the these transboundaries. So uh, I would request Dr. Mansi if the, uh, she want to chip in some points if I have missed out. Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Gautami, and good noon and good morning to everybody. I, I, I wish to ask Vishwanath if there is a room uh, for me to uh, add in, because I think the session started earlier than I expected. Uh, no, you have one minute, Dr. Mansi, if you want okay. to make some pertinent yeah. remark, please go sure. ahead and do that. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Gautami. Uh, I think um, yeah, this kind of studies are very much required to really even talk about water governance from the bottom up approach. Um, because the rising water distress is also telling us to really rethink the way we are looking at water distribution. Because the whole political ecology around water uh, needs to be reworked. And especially uh, the picture which you see on the Godavari um, basin, the Ghat. This itself is going rethinking and uh, uh, they are talking about uh, redoing uh, the whole um, you know, waterfront. So I, this is just an example. We need to rethink the way we are looking at water politically and people have to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both to Gautami and Dr. Mansi for this uh, excellent presentation and for looking at the Ostrom principles and trying to apply it from a bottom up to the whole river basin itself and looking at various aspects of regulation, institutions, people's participation, stakeholder concerns. Uh, very nice one. We'll, uh, both of you, for both Gautami and Dr. Mansi, will take questions in the end whenever the questions yeah. comes in the chat and we'll have a common discussion. So sure. it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Rakshita. She's a student from Tumkur. And Rakshita, you have nine minutes or ten minutes to uh, get your presentation going. Saurav, welcome, Saurav. Your uh, Saurav, you will be going next after Rakshita. Rakshita, the you can start your screen sharing. Morning, everyone. I will be talking about the case study of the city, Karnataka, India, with respect to its interland water and nutrient transactions. It is located at a distance of 70 kilometers from our state capital, Bengaluru. It is having the population of 3,20,000. Tumkur city is an agricultural interland having no perennial source of water. Tumkur is dependent on Elmavati River water from Goruru Dam, which is located at a distance of 170 kilometers. Tumkur is moving towards two milestones. One is 24 hour seven water supply, two is 100% sewer networks. So what is happening to wastewater in the city? As you can see in the map, 
green color area is the area is the number of households which are in the solar system, which makes it about just 17% of the overall population. The rest, majority of the households in the city are dependent on outside sanitation systems. Outside sanitation systems are taken by a sewage treatment plant, and outside sanitation systems are taken by Anisagar is the term used for vacuum trucks, which are uh, which are engaged in large pit uh, Rakshita, just a minute. Dr. Okay. Mansi and others, if you can mute yourself, because then sure. there will not be sure. an echo. So uh, everybody else, please uh, mute, mute yourself, because there's a feedback loop that's created. Rakshita, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so the, the water from the households which are connected to the sewer networks are treated in a sewage treatment plant, which is located at Bhimasandra. So sewage treatment plant is of the capacity 24.75 million liters per day. Post treatment water is led into Bhima Sandra Lake. So wastewater from Bhima Sandra Lake overflows into an adjacent lake called Melekote Lake. So from both the lakes, water has been taken up for irrigation by the farmers. Tumkur City Municip Municipality is coming up with two major proposals. One is the upgradation of technology to sequential batch reactor with additional 25 MLD capacity. Two is the proposal of selling treated wastewater to the industries. So wastewater is generating ecological and economic impacts. So the ecological in, uh, impacts include the rise in the groundwater table. There is perennial source of water provided for irrigation. There is an increase in biodiversity of both Bhima Sandra as well as Melekote lakes. So uh, there is no borewell drilling happened post the entry of treated wastewater. So farmers are using the less quantity of artificial fertilizers. So uh, then what is the economic impact? So economic impact of treated wastewater in Tumkur is interesting. So uh, farmers were cultivating a paddy before the arrival of treated wastewater. Now they have shifted to a wetland crop, which is having the medicinal properties, which is locally called baje, sweet flag. So there is about 200 acres of baje, uh, which is cultivated in the command areas of both Bhima Sandra as well as Melekote lakes. Baje has led to uh, an increase in farmers income from rupees 50,000 to 1 lakh 50,000. Baje is labor intensive in nature, which provides seasonal employment for 5,000 people. So the annual income of rupees 4 crores is generated out of Baje. There is fishing happening in both Bhima Sandra as well as Melekote lake. And, uh, Per year, a revenue of rupees 14 lakh is generated through fishing. Treated wastewater is also a negative impact. So, uh, one major impact is the increase in mosquito breeding. Two is the skin allergies, whereas this is a not widespread issue. There is a decrease in groundwater quality. So, uh, both Bhima Sandra as well as Malekote lakes are dominated by uh, African cod, where this is a, seen to be a threat to local species of fishes. Farmers complain that they cannot cultivate vegetables using treated wastewater. Sanitation systems are dependent on honey suckers. Honey suckers are engaged in emptying, transporting, and disposal of fecal sludge. There is both formal and informal fecal sludge management in Tumkur city. So government-owned honey suckers are, uh, is one in number, which charges about rupees 500 per trip. And uh, it makes about 15 trips in a day. And uh, government-owned anisakas are disposing in the nearest manuals. Whereas the private-owned anisakas are 20 in number, which charges about 1,000 to 1,700 based on the distance. In a day, uh, four uh, number of trips on average is made by private-owned anisakas. So these private-owned anisakas are disposing the fecal sludge in the farms uh, of the farmers. So there is no um, uh, pre-designated space for disposal. Hence, anisakars are seen to be working in partnership with the farmers. So this anisakar and farmers a partnership has generated three major impacts. So one is the social impact, where the automation has allowed people from different social identities to work in the sector. The ecological impact includes the decrease in use of artificial fertilizers for irrigation, and there is a check on the uh, environmental hazard where the fecal sludge is not dumped in open spaces as well as in water bodies. Anisakas uh, has generated livelihood for uh, drivers, helpers, and the truck manufacturers. 
economics of Anisakas is an emerging business industry. So, uh, uh, one making a profit of rupees 10 lakh 80 thousand per year, which makes a single return on investment of just 6 to 12 months. Of course, farmers are the beneficiaries of the fecal sludge. So, farmer would spend rupees 50 thousand on manure per year. So, uh, most of the cases, fecal sludge is provided free of cost. So, here you can see a farmer, Krishna Gauda, who is using the fecal sludge on daily basis for his seven acres of land, which is uh, uh, which he reports a good result in its produce. So, uh, of rupees 3000, which again makes the fecal sludge cheapest of all the menus available. In a day, 50 truckloads of fecal sludge is generated, which is having the potential of fertilizing 100 acres per day. This is generating an opportunity cost of fecal sludge treatment plants investments to city municipal corporation. Systems with water, the fecal sludge are completing the loop and forming circular economy. So, uh, how can the functioning uh, be enhanced is the way through formalization. So, formalization can be done by the uh, involvement of stakeholders where the city municipal corporation can actually provide treated wastewater formally for irrigation, ensuring the better treatment. So, which is further having the possibility of filling up more lakes in the city when there is 100% sewer systems in place. When it comes to on-site sanitation system, there should be a monitoring uh, mechanism taken up by city municipal corporation on the number of honey suckers as well as the farmers who are using the fecal sludge. So one way of formalizing can be done through allowing honey suckers to empty the trucks in the designated manuals or in the primary treatment plant. This is because the uh, STP is not operating to its fullest capacity. For both on-site and off-site sanitation system, there is a need of established knowledge base. So honey suckers in the city are actually not threatened by the uh, arrival of 100% sewer systems, and they are actually prepared to move towards uh, peri-urban areas. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Rakshita. That was. Uh very sharp and very much in tune with the, the highlight of the session. Remember that the workshop, the two-day conference itself is called Sustainable and Resilient Urban-Rural Partnerships. And we are discussing town hinterland, water and nutrient transactions. So here was an example of a town called Tumkur and its relationship with the farming, peri-urban and rural areas, and how both water, wastewater and uh, sludge is being shared. Uh, and with some amount of formality, how it can be made better in terms of the relationships between the farmers and the town itself. Excellent presentation, Rachita. Thank you very much. And we look forward to the questions at the end of the session. Uh, Saurabh, uh, the floor is mm -hmm. now all yours and you have uh, your uh, claim to fame of nine minutes. And at the eighth minute, I'll pop up on my video just to tell you that there's, that you have one minute, right? Saurabh, the floor mm -hmm. is yours. Yeah. Sorry, first screen on Adobe is exiting on on WebEx. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, the screen is visible to us, sort of now. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. Um, so, for my presentation, I'm going to quickly run through a few concepts to kind of ask some overarching questions, considering a lot of the other presentations are going into more detail about some site-specific uh, studies. And one thing I want to promote for the purposes of discussion today is uh, what I'm calling the landscape approach, which is uh, first and foremost, placing the landscape and the socio-ecological system as the foundation for the design of urban form, infrastructure, land management regimes, and territorial systems, recognizing the fact that most of our failures can be traced to short site without considering and that landscape are these kind of contested territories over which many of our wicked problems are unfolding. And to take a socio-ecological systems framework. Uh, why that is relevant for India is because we kind of find ourselves in a very uh, 
in, in a dense mosaic of working landscapes within which the places that we consider urban are embedded. Uh, and it's kind of the inter intersection of what we consider urban with these highly densely populated working landscapes uh, is what we are kind of concerned with today. And that these working landscapes are sustained by relationships that are embedded within watersheds. Uh, but what we have to consider for India is that these watersheds are highly uh, mechanized in the sense that we have canals that kind of uh, cross through multiple watersheds and pump wells that basically tap into the aquifer. So the basin, while it is an ecological landscape planning unit, and there's a lot of benefits that we get from thinking about things from a basin perspective, how do you think about the basin when administrative boundaries as well as hydraulic networks and urbanization itself kind of span multiple basins? Um, and so it is in this context that we kind of think about uh, water scarcity and water stress. Um, and especially recognizing the fact that the Ganga Basin, for for instance, is one of the most densely populated basins in the world, uh, with which is facing a crisis of uh, stressed watersheds, stressed groundwater aquifers, and most importantly, the within that stress uh, of water quantity, we have the stress of water quality, where the sewage whether it's in the surface water and the groundwater threatens whatever depleted sources of water we have, where metropolitan areas uh, like Delhi have an outsized impact on sewage impact. Um, and I will be talking mainly about the case of Kolkata from that perspective of how the East Kolkata wetlands are an excellent example of a resource recovery system on the peripheries where the wetland kind of uses the sewage as a resource. And the other context I would kind of very briefly discuss is the city of Chennai that faces a lot of urban water scarcity that includes other cities like Delhi, Bangalore and Hyderabad, um, among other metropolitan centers. So I'm not going to go into what makes the East Kolkata wetlands special. It has been very well documented and studied and disseminated by uh, Dr. Dhrubajyoti Ghosh and many other researchers. But essentially, the East Kolkata wetland is a huge wetland system comprising of uh, sewage fed fisheries uh, and I'm trying to situate the wetland itself within two scales of three scales of uh, sub basins and recognizing the fact that the basin plays a critical role in the impact of sewage from Kolkata and mitigating the impact of that on the Sundarbans and recognizing the wetland itself as a kind of socio ecological system that emerged out of the fact that highly engineered systems like the canals have been in a sense, appropriated by a community of fishermen into a smaller network of canals, where you see a kind of main town canal built by the British a long time ago, kind of modified into a network of smaller canals, where fishermen use a combination of very low tech and traditional practices to basically turn sewage into a resource for their fisheries and to basically recognize the role that uh, the fishermen themselves play in developing a highly resilient uh, ecosystem. But these ecosystems are not resilient as much to the new pressures of urbanization that represents uh, the wetland today. However, wetlands in India are kind of similar to the EKW, uh, the East Kolkata wetlands is kind of administered through this administrative boundary that basically doesn't recognize the sub basins within which it is a part of. And so the landscape approach kind of situates the wetland within what I'm calling the East Kolkata wetland sub basin. Uh, and what we need to go forward is to understand the surface and subsurface hydrology in a form of hydrological inventory to recognize that wetland conservation isn't just about the boundary that we draw right up to the length of uh, the extent of the wetland as a hydrological system, but to understand what are the inputs from the sub basin around it. To also then recognize that wetlands and many other water bodies in India are intersected by a number of hydraulic in infrastructures that end up cross-cutting different basins, and that these hydraulic infrastructures, including the sewage canal itself, is one of the main sources. Uh, and to also then recognize the other infrastructural conduits like highways that end up bringing in new forms of pollutants and sediment runoff. Uh, the second complex, complex factors of sub-basins, as many of you have pointed out, are the kind of administrative units within the sub-basin. Uh, so the sub-basin itself that I'm highlighting has about spans two districts and 118 villages and four municipalities uh, in, a, in a context from agriculture to non-agriculture, even within the wetland boundaries. 
Um, and finally, uh, recognizing the fact that whatever we are calling the, the wetland boundary does not have an ecological buffer, uh, cons uh, considering that most of the buffer for the wetland, especially towards the west, have been completely built up. Um, and so what we kind of mean by the landscape approach is to kind of take all these things into consideration to really ask ourselves the appropriate unit for which you kind of manage wetlands. And what does it mean that if you are able to establish a kind of ecological governance structure for the sub basin, how far up can you scale up that consideration to where you're thinking about the metropolitan system of wetlands and how a kind of watershed approach can make the city resilient, not just in terms of uh, protecting this wetland that treats half the city's sewage, but also think about the role of the surrounding wetlands for Kolkata and many other metropolitan cities in, in increasing water security and resilience to flooding. Uh, which then brings me just to the case of Chennai, where I will quickly highlight that the conundrum that Chennai faces, and we kind of introduce this idea of the landscape approach through what we are calling the sponge handbook, where a city reels from flooding to drought sometimes in the same year, uh, is a result of us not recognizing how water itself, including when it floods, is a, is a kind of wasted resource. And that as we kind of cycle through droughts and floods, the reason for that is the landscapes that used to be able to absorb the flood and keep it for the future has been broken by patterns of urbanization. And what we try to do in our work with the handbook is to make many officials recognize that the city of Chennai or the metropolitan region of Chennai spans five different river basins and to kind of recognize within those up basins, what are the blue and green systems? Uh, and the reason we kind of recognize that is because a lot of these blue green systems are threatened by unplanned rampant urbanization and urban expansion. And so we're kind of trying to illustrate that what happens when you don't have a metropolitan approach towards basins. I think what we have seen during the drought is a kind of informal relationship between the upper basins and the lower basins through trucks that absorb water, but we don't actually have a kind of coordinated metropolitan response to what to do to your entire sub basin that you're a part of. And so we try to promote this idea of the sponge basin principles that requires you to protect, restore, enhance, and construct various nature-based systems within your basins. Um, and so we kind of introduce a toolkit of approaches that urban municipal infrastructural investments can take and the kind of toolkits that can then come under the principle of construct where we are trying to replicate the functions of a natural systems within the urban fabric through uh, design systems. And what we need to then recognize is that to situate these design systems, we need to develop a metropolitan ecosystem of data sets that we currently don't have. We need to then understand what are our workflows within the planning of our of our sponge ecosystems, not just at the metropolitan scale, but at the sub-basin scale and on the ward scale, and to recognize that any small projects that the municipality takes up, whether it's a small canal project, needs to be embedded within this kind of a sub-basin framework that engages multiple engineering zones and ward levels, and that within the ward levels, any kind of projects that we propose uh, has to be embedded within a kind of framework of what sponge streets and sponge open spaces and sponge buildings can be and that even pilot projects that we try to propose here can be thought of in multiple time horizons where on the short term we are embedding a kind of site into a network of sponge streets and that over time even when you're talking about the canal or the streets this actually requires new relationships to happen between uh, different municipal departments that traditionally don't work together to introduce these kind of streets within uh, the urban fabric and then to think about what it means to have new types of relationship between municipal uh, departments and the city and other stakeholders to kind of build these new forms of infrastructure within the city and to understand that over time we can kind of introduce these different components to different forms of partnership that together as streets and open spaces and buildings kind of form what we are calling a sponge network. And so the landscape approach then is something that could be replicated, not just from a metropolitan basin perspective, but also to think about how from a certain site scale, you can scale up if we take a kind of systems based approach to what it means to replicate the natural functions within a dense urban fabric. And that's what we are kind of trying to address through the landscape approach, going from 
uh, the river basin to metropolitan watersheds to uh, very small scale interventions that keep those principles alive. Thank you. Great presentation, Saurav, and beautifully illustrated, truly coming from a landscape architect or from that basis that you're able to span entire river basins like the Ganges, you know, talking about the Ganges water machine, Antonia Chavetti's book, to talk about Dhrubajyoti Ghosh, who was a personal friend also, and with the East Kolkata wetland systems with the formal and the informal work so beautifully, and then to talk about sponge basins and sponge cities, and to look at the micro detail from a building to the river basin. That, that kind of a span is absolutely fascinating. Thank you for the presentation, Saurav. And we'll wait for the questions uh, at the end of the session. The, the next speaker is Neha, Neha Garwal from the CPR. Uh, Neha, the floor is yours. You can introduce yourself and the uh, uh, institution also, and you make your presentation, please. Thank you so much, Vishwanath, and as well to Alka for organizing this session, and thanks to URP 2020 for talking about this very, very important issue of urban rural partnerships. Um, my name is Neha. And I'm a research associate with the Center for Policy Research in India with a public policy think tank that work on a diverse array of themes, wherein my particular research group looks at water and sanitation in both urban and rural India. My present chain today, I'm going to be speaking about uh, three key topics. First one is just how do we view urban rural spaces and sanitation in India? Second is, how can we institutionalize urban rural linkages for sanitation in the country? And what the key takeaways have been from an evolving process, which we are a part of in the city um, of Dhenkana, the surrounding rural areas in the district, in the state of Odessa, India. When we talk about urban rural partnerships, it's very interesting to note that in India, different bodies look at different definitions of urban and rural. So when we talk about the administrative lens, we think of urban and rural largely in terms of the urban local body, which can take the form of municipal corporations, municipalities and such. And then we have rural bodies, which are gram panchayats, a cluster of villages together. When the census of India goes out and collects data on rural and urban populations, what type of access they have to different services, Therein, they define a third category, which is what we call census town. Since the definition of urban local bodies and gram panchayats are essentially administrative and not really linked to characteristics, Census of India provides that nuance to say that, OK, there are regions in the country which are on the spectrum of urban and rural, demonstrate urban characteristics, but are not classified or governed as urban. And finally, Concept of large and dense villages as part of a recent study that we had done, where we see that even within this census town to village spectrum, there is potential to identify what we call large and dense villages and therefore open up the spectrum a little bit, which helps us understand what are the preferences of households um, across this spectrum and how we should plan for providing services. Before we go on, I would also like to point out that right from the national level down to the local level, when we think about how to build these urban rural bridges and linkages, the ministries and the government departments are very clearly and linearly bifurcated. So what does this spectrum essentially mean for sanitation services? And uh, I, 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 Rakshita in that sense provided a really great introduction to how um, when we talk about sanitation in India, we are largely talking about on-site sanitation. Uh, the penetration of centralized sewerage systems stands very low in India and not just in rural spaces, but also in our urban spaces. And you can see that shift very clearly as you go from villages to large dense villages to census towns and then finally to statutory towns or what we call the urban local bodies. Of course, the way these numbers look have it's 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 flipped drastically over the last five years. As some of you may be aware, we've had a national toilet construction drive lasting over the last five years, uh, where there was subsidized toilet construction, and along with the toilet construction, there was the construction of on-site sanitation systems as well. Now, what's interesting is that since the 1980s, the way that we have looked at rural sanitation, we've thought that. The twin pit system, which is essentially a system where the waste goes in, 
you let it stay there for a, a prolonged period of time and it comes out as compost. We've thought of that as the most suitable system from that time without recognizing that the, the very fabric in nature of Indian villages is changing over time and they require different types of technologies. And so fecal sludge management becomes very, very important, not just for our urban areas where we have non-network sanitation, but for our rural areas as well. So in a recent work, we work with the municipality of Dhenkanal in Orissa, which is um, a small town, uh, and demonstrated with the first pilots in the country in a small town, which established a fecal sludge management system. And over a period of time, so from its commissioning in 2018, the management of the plant changed. So starting from government to a private operator to now a self-help group. And what's interesting about, and, and why I bring this up is that while the plant was being operated by a, a private sector operator, they also were catering to rural areas around the urban FSTP. Now, this is interesting because when we talk about urban rural linkages or the transfer of nutrients and those type of transactions, we are mostly thinking of it as, you know, urban waste gets treated, the end products get used in rural areas, or maybe uh, urban waste gets semi-treated or, or not treated and like the honey suckers deliver the waste to the rural areas. But what about rural areas when they have their own demand and need for these services? And, and that's why it becomes important to really close in the loop and think about how rural areas can be extended the services from urban areas when such instances and convergences are possible to make. And so, of course, the, the market in that, set, in that sense is able to drive some of these outcomes, but not always um, in an ideal manner. So here in we saw that, you know, in order to maximize operational efficiencies while rural areas were being provided these services, there were the issues of access, right? Where if the market is driving the prices, then not all rural households may have access to these services, resulting not only in hazardous cleaning of these septic tanks and pits that are prevalent in rural areas, but also in some cases where households have, uh, in our data collection over uh, the last uh, few months, they feel that they've chosen to not use the toilets anymore if they don't have access to these type of services. And that is why it was very important for us to think about how we can institutionalize these urban rural linkages so that these are not one-off cases uh, that are sporadic in nature. And, to, and, and, and with that in mind, we had to answer three key questions. First is who to serve, how to serve, and then who operates and manages the services? So when we talk about who to serve, how many houses do we cover under each intervention? How many villages are we talking about? And this is affected by characteristics, geospatial feasibility, administration. Um, in terms of who to, how to serve them to, how do we build those assets? And how do we operate and manage them over time? How do we co-finance for some of, um, uh, how do we co-finance these services? One example that, of course, one could look to, and in that sense, the developmental twin of sanitation is water. And recently, to the government has started this program of uh, ensuring wide-scale uh, water supply augmentation across the country. And there, there is some, some, some aspect of regional development when we're talking about, you know, thinking about uh, providing these services at the multi-village level. But then. We're still talking about rural-rural coordination. With sanitation, it's interesting because in, in the case of Orissa, and, and based on this decentralized approach of FSM, the state is going to be creating 94 more of these plants, right? And if you look at the district here, and this is part of the project that we're undertaking, you can see the urban areas, these three red areas, which are the urban areas, around which we can very easily identify the rural areas that can be feasibly served. And for rural areas that cannot be feasibly served, as you can see in the second map, can then be clustered into groups for which infrastructure can be created or some systems for safe management of fecal sludge can be created. And while data can be an important starting point uh, for answering some of the questions that we saw before, and we've done this exercise quite widely, what we're realizing over time is that there are very, very complex and interacting dimensions in establishing these linkages. So starting from data, we need to think about 
how the co-financing will happen between the rural local body, the urban local body, the district government, and finally the state. Because that also affects how and accountable for the delivery of these services. Right. So if this is a state driven process or a district driven process, do local urban bodies or are, are rural local bodies really empowered to deliver these services and to respond to uh, you know, uh, the, the citizen demands for these services? And finally, what is the regulatory environment within which we're able to provide these services? And although this is a very um, this is a process which we have been a part of for uh, some time, we're still learning. And what we've realized is that it is very, very important to unpack this urban rural dichotomy that that understanding that spectrum has a very strong bearing on the design and the financing of the sanitation interventions that we come up with through national programs. And that even when we don't do that, urban rural bridges build themselves in response to the market insensitive and the forces at large. But these may not always lead to equitable and accessible outcomes. Right. And, and, and it, it, these outcomes can be especially adverse when government comes in to correct for these outcomes, their priorities might not always be walking a straight line. So while we know that it's important from public health perspective, from sanitation worker safety to build these circular loops between urban and rural areas, are the government motivated these bridges and how these sort of like linkages come into place is something that we need to study better create examples for and institutionalize because with the scale that we're talking about 542 million people still without access to safely managed sanitation and uh, the 2030 SDG deadline looming we need to really uh, the, uh, you know uh, strengthen the cause for the strengthen the case for rural urban and rural rural regional cooperation and finally we hope that this case of the canal will be you know, it already is a very novel attempt to solve for some of these issues, but that it would provide a template for doing this, not just with the sanitation sector, but also other sectors um, in the time to come. With that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Neha. Very interesting. And as usual, uh, thinking of the entire chain of sanitation, not merely the toilets, but what happens to the waste afterwards, how is it to be productively used, and the various systems that have to be put in place before everything is safely managed. and the challenges of the huge urban population and the goals that are required. Excellent. It's a sort of a, all the presentations are beautifully linked in terms of the linkages between urban and rural areas. And thank you for that. So uh, next uh, presenter is uh, Marcel. Marcel, the, uh, please do introduce yourself and the institution and your paper and you have 10 minutes, right? Marcel, go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning all together in Germany and uh, I wish you a good afternoon to the audience in India. Um, I think that I have some technical problems because I can't share my uh, screen with you. So if you can't see my presentation now, um, uh, we can't. Perhaps Sebastian. I, I think it's. Yeah, could you, Sebastian, um, open it from the backup, please? Uh, yeah, I think I can do that. Um, what's the title of that presentation? Um, it's called Regal uh, Activated okay, okay. Carbon. All right, I have it. Just a second. Yeah, perfect. So just tell me when I um, shall go to the next slide, okay? Okay, thank you. Ah, yes. Okay, so I would start to introduce myself. Um, my name is Marcel Riegel. I work at the TZW, which is a German water center, and I'm a chemical engineer, and my main working topics is about uh, drinking water treatment, and we do applied science within this, and also consultant projects. Okay, sorry, I had a, um, again, some technical problems. Um, I would like to tell you now something about a more technical topic. Um, I would like to talk about um, wastewater treatment with activated carbon and especially with a sustainable activated carbon. And um, if you go to the next slides, please. Um, the background about this is that an additional wastewater treatment, which we call the fourth period 
purification stage uh, becomes more and more important in larger cities in Germany and in Switzerland. And in general, two different techniques are used there. The one is activated carbon, where normally powdered activated carbon in use. And the second one is ozonation. And I would like to talk about the first technique about activated carbon. And this technique has two uh, bigger disadvantages. The one is that uh, the material costs are quite high. So you have to pay for the activated carbon. And this is the, the main cost about this technique. And the second disadvantage is that this um, technique has a certain pressure on the global warming potential because most of the activated carbon used in Europe is based on fossil resources like hard coal. And uh, all of these products are um, um, produced in East Asia and they have to be transported to Europe first. And this is uh, quite a long distance for this material. So if you please go to the next slide. Um, having this background in mind, we started um, to build up a research project. We wanted to produce a new activated carbon from biomasses, which are regional, which are here from, from Germany, which are residual. That means that they don't have any other uses, that there are uh, garbage material, that there are rural they um, came up on the rural side and uh, are used in, um, in the cities and that these biomasses are renewable. So um, they are not from out of fossil um, resources, but they are from renewable resources. So if we are able to produce such an activated carbon, we could protect fossil raw materials and uh, we could reduce the material transport. And these materials should be implemented in urban wastewater treatment plants with the goal to re remove organic trace substances. So we started a project which is called the COAC project, project, which is funded by the German Ministry of Research and Education within its funding activity, urban-rural interactions. And altogether, nine partners included in this project. Uh, two of them are the city of Friedrichshafen at the Lake Constance, and they would like to use this produced activated carbon within their um, wastewater treatment plant. And uh, the other one other partner is the district of Bodenseekreis, which is the district around the city of Friedrichshafen, and all these biomasses where we produce this activated carbon out came from this district. So if you please go to the next slide. Um, one problem we have is the characterization of activated carbon. Why is this so? Um, the adsorption ability of different activated carbons varies immensely towards the um, adsorption of organic micropollutants. But the problem is you can't see it. Activated co carbon is just a black powder or black grains, but you can't see um, if it's a good adsorbent or not. Um, so what do you do? You perform some experiments and uh, out of these experiments, you would like to see if you have a good adsorption ability or if you don't. And this um, characterization of the activated carbon um, was our part of the work. And I would like to um, show you some, ex uh, some uh, results of this characterization. Um, the first results I would like to show you here are um, two um, standard parameters to characteri characterize activated carbons, uh, which is the iodine number and the methylene blue number. And these two um, parameters give you, an, give you a knowledge about the inner surface of the activated carbon. And on this uh, diagram here, you see these two parameters for six coals, um, for two commercial coals on the right side, and for four coals we produced within our project, two coals which were produced out of, of grassland, really green and wet grassland. One was produced out of hop spikes and one of mice straw. And you see that the uh, bars for the commercial activated carbons are much bigger. That means that the inner surface is much bigger for these commercial coals than for the coals we produced within the pro project. And this is an indicator for a, a poorer adsorption ability for our products. And on the next slide, if you go more into detail about the adsorption ability of the coals, uh, you get quite different results. 
On this slide here, um, you see the results from some experiments we performed by using some wastewater um, effluent. And into this effluent, we put some different amounts of activated carbon, um, 5 milligram per liter up to 20 milligram per liter. And uh, we measured an easy to measure parameter, the so-called SAK, the spectra spectral adsorption coefficient, which gives you an idea about the uh, natural occurring uh, organic substances in the wastewater. And we shake this um, water for 24 hours. And after this time, we measured the SAK again and just calculated the removal of this parameter. And um, the, the removal which we measured is uh, shown on this on this diagram. And here uh, you see that or the removal of this parameter gives you an indication about the uh, adsorption ability in general about uh, of activated carbons. And uh, the highest uh, removal is performed by one uh, commercial activated carbon, the yellow one, but the other commercial activated carbon in green shows the same adsorption ability than the products we produced without in uh, our project. And this is a different evaluation than when you use the, the um, the UD number or the methylene blue number. So here you get an indication that our codes work quite well for the adsorption of organic substances. And on the next slide, please. If you have a look at different um, real organic micropollutants, here are shown two examples. One is diclofenac and the other one is hydrochloride chlorotacid, which are found in um, wastewater effluents. Um, you also see that the re removal uh, efficiency you can see um, is quite outperformed for the code we produced out of mice straw, which is the, the red line, but also the other codes we produced show uh, adsorption um, um, an adsorption uh, efficiency, which is quite comparable to the um, activated carbon, which you could buy. So in general, uh, on the next slide, please, we could say that the activated carbons we produced within our project out of regional, residual, rural and renewable biomasses, they can reach comparable comparable adsorption abilities towards different micro pollutants. And um, because of this, it is possible to substitute standard activated carbon by our products. And if um, we could re reach this substitution, we could use a more sustainable product. And because um, of the local product we use, we can also reduce the CO2, CO2 footprint of this technique of um, of uh, activated carbon usage in wastewater treatment plant. Yes, and um, this is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Marcel. That was very interesting and in that you start to think about activated charcoal at local level with local biomass and to see how well they are performing is uh, is a huge step in addressing emerging contaminants in wastewater treatment plants, which is a challenge not only in Germany, but all across the world, I'm sure. So thank you for your uh, presentation, Marcel, and I'm sure that there will be some questions for you, and we'll discuss that uh, immediately after the final presentation. And uh, let me introduce the next speaker. The next speaker is myself, Vishwanath. Uh, I'm from the city of Bangalore. Uh, I with a small group called the Biome Environmental Trust, and I hope to be sharing with uh, the group uh, a small discussion on the metropolis and its hinterland in terms of the urban rural partnerships. And I'm talking about my city, Bengaluru, which is the capital of the state of Karnataka in India. There's the city of ours with a population of 12 million approximately now, located 900 meters above sea level which means that the waters that we get to the city has to come from a distance of about 95 kilometers and has to be pumped up over 300 meters, making it a very expensive water. And it's about 1,400 million liters, which now comes in with uh, 600 million liters of additional groundwater being consumed by the city. And that's an approximation. A total of 1,800 million liters per day of wastewater is generated. And so the question is, what happens to the wastewater? So for the wastewater, the city utility, which is in charge of both water supply and wastewater called the Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board, short form BWSSB, uh, 
has set up a series of uh, wastewater treatment plants across the three major valleys of the city. Sora was talking about watersheds, urban watersheds. We have three broad urban watersheds in our city of Bangalore, but different colors show you the three major valleys within which are micro watersheds for which there's every link. And the city has set up 25, 25 such uh, wastewater treatment plants. Now, the way treated wastewater and the untreated wastewater goes out of the city and uh, what I'm showing you is one picture where the agricultural reuse extends to a distance of about 50 kilometers from the city, right? And the red line shows the river Dutch in Tenakini, which has the, which has the uh, untreated wastewater use. Now, as the untreated wastewater leaves the city, thanks to the phosphates, detergents, and surfactants, you find that the, the froth and foam uh, prevails in many places. And this is a major ecological issue which captures the attention of the media also. And this is the sad state of some of our uh, lakes as well as wastewater bodies. But a few kilometers away, nature is doing its job and there is ecological treatment and there, there's no froth and foam, though the phosphates and surfactants are still present in the wastewater. And so what farmers do, because farmers are dependent on groundwater for their water requirements all in the periphery of the city, in the interland of Bangalore, is they dig a well. You see the small well next to the next to the river, and from the well, they pump water, sometimes to the extent of seven kilometers, putting their own pipeline and putting their own monies, something like 3 million rupees or 30 lakh rupees in Indian, and using it in their uh, farms. And these pump houses dot the river. These pump houses uh, are pumping untreated wastewater, mind you. There are something like 5,000 such pump houses on the, one of the river stretches. Now, the water is pumped to the farmer's field, the slavey farmer, and uh, it's, uh, this untreated wastewater is stored in a pond and it's diluted sometimes with uh, bore well water, water from the groundwater aquifer, and then is applied onto the fields. This is a very common practice. And not a drop of wastewater which leaves the city when it's untreated actually is unutilized. Every drop is picked up and used by farmers all across the two rivers which leave the city. And what are the crops grown? And, Sometimes the crops grown, some of the crops grown is what I'm showing you. On the leftmost, you can still see some of the froth in the field. There's rice being cultivated. Uh, farmers have experimented with various varieties of rice and have arrived at something called rajini, a particular variety which does very well with untreated wastewater, and that's grown profusely, as well as millets on the bottom right is millets. Rakshita had shown a medicinal crop called bhaje or uh, Sweet flag in Tumkur, that is not grown here, but it's more the common grains that are grown. Now, that's the informal wastewater which is being generated in the city and our farmers are using it up. Now, there's therefore a formalization of the whole process and Bangalore is running one of the largest projects in the world where treated wastewater is to be shipped for agricultural water use. So the numbers that are given here, where you see is 810 at the bottom, now, 810 million liters of treated wastewater will fill irrigation tanks or lakes, as they are called, dispersed in the two districts called Kolar and Chikbalapur, which are drought prone and climate affected districts. And about 290 lakes are to be filled with treated wastewater from the city of Bangalore. So here's how it looks like. Before implementation, this is a tank, which is a man-made lake. That's the terminology used here. Before implementation of the project called the KNC Valley project, it's bone dry. For 12 years, there was no, not a drop of, of water in it. Post the implementation of the project, the project meaning treated wastewater to secondary uh, standards, then chlorinated, and then pumped about 52 kilometers, then now it fills up the lake. And that's how the lake looks like, the figure on the right, after treat, treated wastewater fills it up. Once the lake is full, then it cascades down and starts fill, filling a series of lakes by gravity process. And mind you, all these lakes are being filled with cascading untreated, uh, treated wastewater. As the treated wastewater leaves the first lake and goes to the second one, the quality continues to improve. Phosphates continue to reduce, nitrates continue to reduce, and then it, uh, it then goes through ecological process of uh, rejuvenation. Uh, some more figures, once uh, it reaches uh, the seventh or eighth lake, then it's picked up again and pumped to the ridge line. And then from the ridge line, it's uh, pushed down to the next series of gravity tanks. So overall about 120 kilometers of distance will be covered and 290 tanks is the, 290 lakes is the current estimate, but it's likely to reach 500 lakes in the coming year or two because there's a huge uh, 
demand for wastewater to come in and fill the lakes. And therefore, where lakes were previously filled to the brim, now they're being half filled and then pushed around to the next lake. And what you see now on the left is a pumping station. The blue and white one is a pumping station. These are large water bodies and they're now perennially full. You know, whereas previously, they would fill up uh, three times in 10 years and they would be dry for about eight months in a year. Now they're perennially full. So this is how the rising main, when it brings water to the first lake looks like. It's a rising main, it's a pipe. The water is put under pressure, it cascades down and then flows into the lake. The local lakes are auctioned by the gram panchayats or the village water bodies for fishing rights. And in the first lake itself, fish is being cultivated. About 500 kgs of fish is harvested a week. The fish is both a livelihood generator as well as a bio indicator for the quality of the wastewater. And it's being constantly monitored for, for its health and for the um, eatability of the fish. Now, the whole idea with the treated wastewater transfer project is uh, to make sure that the wastewater is not used directly by the lakes, from the lakes by the farmers, but is allowed to recharge the aquifers. It fills the shallow wells, and from the shallow wells, farmers pick up the water and pump it into their fields and use it. A lot of farmers use um, drip irrigation systems also. Cucumbers are grown, as is seen in this figure, and farmers uh, now have a livelihood certainty in the era of climate change Treated wastewater is, is drought proof and climate proof water in a particular sense. And as you can see in the right side, that's drip irrigation being used from the open well. Now, the advantage of an open well is that it uses very less energy to pump water, unlike deep bore wells. And therefore, energy consumption and carbon emissions are also less thanks to this uh, shallow aquifer becoming full. What should be the standards for treatment of the wastewater? The standards are evolving. The National Green Tribunal, which is the local environmental court, has decided that the standards should be strict and there should be a biological nutrient removal. So on the right side column, you see that total phosphate, TP, is now to be less than one. Total nitrogen, which was previously not an issue, has to be less than 10. Now, emerging contaminants will also have to be discussed in the future, but this is now the standards that have to be met before treated wastewater can, fill, can be used to fill water bodies or for inland application. There is this major chart I'm just showing you that there's something called a methodology of the sanitation safety plan as developed by the World Health Organization. This moves away from a standards approach to a risk management approach. And it's a very ideal tool to identify the various risks at the various processes of collection of treated wastewater, treatment of it, pumping of it, filling of the lakes, the use by farmers, and finally the use by consumers of the products developed. And therefore the risks can be identified and from a high risk one can take measures to push it down to a low risk measure, right? And so the severity of the risk uh, has to be understood and then has to be worked upon. Just to give you an example, if a non-edible crop is grown instead of an edible crop, a non-edible crop like mulberry or flowers or eucalyptus or acacia, it dramatically reduces the risk for the consumption of the crop or the grain by the consumer, whoever it is. So simple steps like this can be taken to reduce the severity of the risk of the use of treated wastewater. And that is what is also being sought to be applied. So finally, the key observation is that there is a the city hinterland, hinterland link can be established through wastewater and fecal sludge. Livelihoods can be securitized and there could be water and wastewater security. A vast hinterland can be developed and it's estimated that from the city of Bangalore alone, about 64,000 hectares of land can be irrigated perennially throughout the year using treated wastewater. Farmers can be persuaded to move to non-edible crops as long as it's tied to their livelihood and they make an income or earn monies. Farmers report less need of fertilizers, however, more requirement of weed sites with the treated wastewater because it's nutrient rich. All wastewater generated is reused in farming. There's no formal institutional mechanism existing to monitor and manage this at the farmer field level. We need to develop those systems of, of, uh, of control and understanding the risks. Farmers make huge investments in pumping the wastewater into their fields, and that has to be respected and taken into wastewater policies. And finally, like I mentioned before, a risk management approach as using the sanitation safety plan would provide the way forward to ensure that all environmental risks and health risks are taken care of. Thank you very much. And that was my presentation. What we can do now is perhaps to move to discussions. Alka, if you would want to step in for a minute and uh, sort of missed you at the beginning, and if you can 
make a few comments, then we can take it forward from you. Uh, you're muted, Okay. Alka, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Sorry for this goof up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, Vishwanath, should should you take the questions? Yeah. Uh, please, uh, Alka, if you can help out with that, and uh, if there are yeah. questions that you would want to ask people, I would I would request Sebastian to post the questions if they are any on MEA platform. Uh, yeah, I collected uh, all the questions. Um, they are actually in the chat, but uh, I can uh, okay. post them again, or I can read them out if you want. Uh, no, I, I can also read it. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Mansi's question to Rakshita. Uh, she's suggesting that it will be interesting to upscale the cases for Meta's uh, study to contest the centralized wastewater treatment system for such decentralized approach. So, yeah, there is a suggestion from uh, uh, Mansi to Rakshita. I think uh, Vishwanath's presentation is in a way mentioning this, that how that this can be scaled up. Uh, Bangalore is taking it up in a very big way. So, yeah, uh, Vishwanath, do you want to add to this? Oh, so uh, the other presentations were also there. Aspirationally, people want the sewerage systems. They are not happy with on plot systems. If it is possible for the government to invest and if uh, sewage sanitation lines can come, then they're very happy with it. Now, the decision, which is a the tougher decision in policy making, is what should happen to the treated wastewater? Should it go for industrial urban use? Should it go for ecological use? Should it go for agricultural use? And how will the hierarchy be determined? And Alka is doing a PhD on that, so I'm not going to talk much more about it. So that's the way the uh, the, the the challenge before us is, right? Uh, no. So uh, Rakshita and Vishwanath, both of you. So one of the things in NGT's standards was that removal of phosphorus. Whereas phosphorus itself is the major nutrient for farmers. So how will you like, you know, actually if there was a technology available by which you can keep the nutrient and uh, remove the risks, I don't know how, but uh, that would be very beneficial to farmers. So anyone answer, want to answer this particular one, it would be good. Rachita, you want to answer this? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, so actually, farmers are in need of uh, nutrients and uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. So yes. the problem is here that you know, uh, uh, but the NGT rules. So I had a discussion with Tumkur City Municipality where the, uh, the executive engineer uh, is like, has to follow the NGT norms where the the nutrients has to be removed. So that is yes. the challenge. So uh, the way forward is the uh, is still not clear so probably uh, uh, researchers has to work with NGT to allow the nutrients uh, for the use of irrigation so whereas if it is the industrial use probably uh, that would not be an issue okay i could come in here also just to quickly comment on the sure, question sure 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 yeah um i think this question is in part addressed by vishnath's presentation as well wherein when we think about setting these standards we go for a very westernized approach and what we need to move towards is a more risk-based approach where we understand what is it that is our end use if we want to use the wastewater ultimately for agriculture or even biosolids for that matter then it should be a graded standard for that maybe therein we want to regulate pathogens instead of regulating the nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations right um, or for something like industries, the standard could be a little different. So it's it's about, again, managing risks and knowing what to regulate for, what is important to regulate for a given setting. Yeah, but Neha, my question is this only, that NGT right now is becoming very stringent about the standards. It's not at all reduction of risk approach. So, like, how will that be handled by the farmers or whoever wants to use it? Industries can definitely do that, but... Uh, which is a direct question to Saurav, because Saurav, in theory, 
the east kolkata wetlands uh, is a completely illegal enterprise according to the standards and according to the cpcb and the uh, and the ngt standards right so how in your imagination is the formal and the informal to coexist in when you design spawn cities and wastewater catchments and how can master plans and building bylaws be more accommodative of the informal economy so yeah, the case of the East Kolkata wetlands is interesting because uh, the fish that's grown through the process ends up serving up to a third of the city's protein uh, supply. Um, and there's a very kind of organized uh, network of producer associations uh, that are somewhat quite recognized by certain state bodies who then have access to the markets that then kind of enter into the city. Uh, but I think uh, Dhruvajuti Ghosh, among many others, had done studies on whether there are unhealthy levels of certain pollutants within within the fish. And, um, and basically, the good thing is Kolkata sewage isn't Delhi sewage. It's, it's a different type of sewage where it's much less industrial. And so uh, the the threat to the East Kolkata wetlands wasn't the normal type of sewage flowing into the system because the fishermen are very careful in terms of how long it's allowed to stay in these settling ponds, how much sunlight there is, uh, how oxygenated the the mixture is before it's released into the fish and at what stage they actually introduce sewage as a nutrient for fish. Uh, so it's not at very early stages of their life cycle. Um, the threat it turns out for the wetland today is that because of the because of the kind of urbanization coming up around it <clears throat> there's more elevated levels of sedimentation within the canals and there's new types of pollutants uh, getting into the mix uh, and that's the reason i kind of thought about what's the next step for management because the way they have drawn the boundary for what's a recognized wetland and how you manage and protect the wetland is that they have drawn a boundary around specific villages at the border of the wetland without considering that uh, new town Kolkata and every other development that's north and west of the wetland today is having Absolutely. new kinds of impact <clears throat> on the ecosystem that the fishermen aren't that resilient to adapt to. <clears throat> Alka, other questions? There, there is another one for Saurav. Uh, that yeah. was from me, Saurav. I wanted you to define what you uh, you mentioned about metropolitan watersheds. Yeah. How will you define a uh, watershed in a city yeah. or metropolitan watershed? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the point I wanted to make, and I'm glad I have the chance to express it in the Q and A, is that the way metropolitan watersheds have to be considered differently from how we understand watershed is that metropolitan regions don't adhere to their natural limitations of what the topography is. Most cities, as they get bigger, start appropriating other watersheds. So in the case of Kolkata, the moment the British designed uh, a sewage outfall that goes uh, eastward rather than the natural flow into the Hooghly River, they basically attach themselves to a different uh, the metropolitan management plan of Kolkata, who helped their sewage system depends on the health of the ecosystem, now has to consider the aspect of its metropolitan watershed. Uh, Chennai now is a lot. The small city, it was home and basin. Now that's the bigger city, it spans five different river basins. But uh, it's gotten a Uh, rural land. The make all the watershed. On other. Right. So we've got two yeah. minutes, so we'll just take the next yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah, we just got two minutes, so we'll just take the next question, sir. Yeah. There is a question for Marcel from me again, that there are several groups in India which are making coal out of biomass. So what would be the difference between manufacturing, manufacturing 
versus activated carbon. Yes, there's one big difference. Um, if you produce coal, you just use a pyrolysis step where you uh, make coal out of biomass. And if you would like to receive activated carbon, you need an additional activation step. And this can be performed with a chemical activation or with a physical activation. And we perform the physical activation where you bring some hot water steam in contact with the coal. And this water reacts with part of the coals and forms this large inner surface. And after this activation step, you will have an activated carbon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a question for um, Vishwanath to Neha. Uh, yeah, I, I, I got the answer to that. Neha has given the answer to the gray water one. We have one minute left, Alka. So if you want to make some closing check, remarks. Check if there are more questions. No, Alka, we just have one minute left. If you could make the closing remarks, that would be great. I think you take it ahead, Vishwanath, please. What? I've been talking too much. So anyway, thanks a lot for all the presenters. It's uh, We are sticking to German standard time and uh, we just have one minute left. It was very, it was very interesting, and these are all extremely uh, new fields, which I'm sure a lot of us as researchers and people who are learning from the field very much appreciate the uh, the chance that we are getting to be engaged in such problems. You no, know? uh, from Rachita, Neha, Gautami to Marcel and his uh, biomass and activated charcoal. So it's been a, a wonderful journey, and thanks Alka for bringing it all together because uh, it was your idea and initiative which got this all uh, together. And I'm sure that in the in the future, we'll look at this urban regional partnerships to be more firmly institutionalized and much, much more done with a sense of livelihood and participation of the rural linkages, which is so essential for policy making and for legal framing of the, of the problem and the solutions that we face, both in the developing world and in the developed world. Thanks a lot for everybody to participate. And we are right on time, Stefan, uh, Sebastian, as promised. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks. Thanks for being yeah, here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.